Okay, how are you doing today? Is everything all right? I'm here. <laughs> it's me. Okay, um, <clears throat> just two quick reminders. First is um, the date of simulation will be the 28th, not next week. I mean, the week after that, Tuesday. And we will start on Tuesday at like 10.30. And we normally have two hours, but there is this lunch time. If it is necessary, we are going to use that lunch time as well. So I don't know whether the simulation will last more than two hours or maybe uh, two hours and a half. So we will do our best to wrap up things. And this is up to the Secretary General. Uh, to conduct these uh, discussions. And the second thing about the op-eds, while well, some of you keep sending me uh, topics that you, know, you think about, well, fine, it's always good to share with me. But um, the first thing about op-eds that I repeat, I don't know, maybe 20th time, it is important that you have an opinion. It is important that you have a viewpoint that you sort of aggressively, so to speak, um, put in and discuss in the paper. And of course, you have to substantiate it. You have to back it up. You have to support it with if there are any facts, figures, data, or other people's views, or some statements made, etc. So you have a viewpoint, and you support it. You believe in something. You propose something. You discuss something. but. <laughs> Op-ed is not something that you present everybody else's viewpoint and just in a descriptive manner and leave it that way. You have to have your own opinion. Your personal point, your personal stance must be there. And the thing about op-ed is that the deadline is, uh, was actually supposed to be, first of all, 3rd of December, which was not so much uh, a realistic deadline. But we postponed it to the 17th, meaning this Friday, but I postponed it to the next Friday. So 24th is the deadline, and it's the ultimate deadline for op-eds, because I have to have the op-eds um, by the end of the year so that I can sit and read your op-eds. Before I give you the final exam, I will have to read them as well. So I cannot read op-eds coming from 44 students uh, and the final exams. Uh, because I think it's on the 13th, is it? The final exam? Yes. All right, and it's going to be one of the last days of final. So the administration uh, wants us to submit the papers, the grades actually, uh, within a couple of days. So those who give the final exam at the beginning of the final exam schedule, fine, because they have time for reading, grading, making all sorts of evaluations, and. Also, uh, I don't know, making adjustments is, if necessary based on the requests coming from students, as always the case at the end of each semester. But So I will not have much time uh, giving you the exam on the 13th. That will leave me with a few days before the final submission. So it is essential that you submit your op-eds on, on 31st, uh, 30, uh, sorry, 24th of December, okay? So that I may have uh, time for reading because I myself have my own schedule, too many deadlines, chapters, articles, papers, conferences. I don't know how, how I'm dealing with all this, but I still survive. So since I can come here with a couple of hours of sleep, that means I can uh, deal with them. But you should not put extra uh, burden on my shoulders by submitting your papers late. because. Late submissions will not be accepted. Please take note of this, 24th of December, last day for submissions of op-eds. And with respect to the simulation, actually, um, I was planning to talk about um, terrorism issues because it's, a, it's not a new subject for those who are in the field. Terrorism has been around for at least uh, more than half a century. Actually, it's as old as humanity. So we can go as far back as uh, BC times, I mean, before Chris, I mean, minus uh, dates, so long as uh, 
you want to see something from terrorist, terrorism perspective. But of course, uh, terrorism is also a phenomenon of uh, this contemporary age, modern age, which of course attracted the attention of many scholars, scientists, of course administrations, and experts. So this is something that I would like to discuss before the end of the semester because we have to be in conformity with the syllabus that I distributed at the beginning of the semester. And we have sort of uh, kept a certain balance in terms of uh, meeting the schedule. I may have uh, assigned a little bit more importance to Iran's nuclear program and its implications, not simply to what Iran was doing, but we have looked into what others were doing with respect to Iran uh, and its nuclear program. So, um, but I, I believe it is necessary for you to make some preliminary readings before we um, go into the subject of terrorism. So you will receive a number of uh, articles, chapters, uh, which are easy to read, which give you a background um, about how or what were the you know, initial um, sort of uh, events, preliminary things about terrorism, how this issue evolved into a much bigger problem, what was the impact of 9-11, or what were the you know, causes and cons consequences of 9-11. All this, uh, you will receive this, uh, these articles, chapters, um, by the end of today, possibly the latest tomorrow. So, and I, I want you to make these readings. Um, I may also suggest you some sort of a um, order for reading. So you may want to read in the order that I suggest you to read chapters so as to understand things better because terrorism as you might have followed from the news, especially cyber terrorism, other than terrorism that we knew so far, uh, has become one of the most uh, important uh, subjects for governments. I mean, as you, again, I uh, believe you follow from the news in, the, in one of the most recent um, executive council meetings of National Security Council. Uh, cyber terrorism was included in the threats the Turkish government and the state as a whole uh, actually perceived as something that must be tackled with, or something that you cannot just let go. And something that has actually confirmed was the leaking of files through WikiLeaks. Well, this is not a terrorist attack, of course. You, you cannot put the WikiLeaks event in the basket of terrorism, but it's something that um, gives us an idea as to what are the possibilities in the cyberspace. So it is something that is necessarily very, very interesting. Uh, as you know very well, um, I am the academic advisor of the NATO Center of Excellence Defense Against Terrorism, where over the last several years we have convened workshops, week-long courses, symposia, um, conferences, where we have discussed almost all dimensions of terrorism and what are the measures, countermeasures, what are the threats, what are the dimensions of threats, etc., etc. So you will have a number of readings for this Friday this week, next Tuesday and next Friday we will confine our attention to the issue of terrorism. And I would like to take advantage of today, uh, having many of you uh, here, uh, to actually get your contributions, I mean, your sort of participation more in this discussion about I Iran's nuclear program, because you should definitely uh, not forget the fact that in two weeks' time, about this hour, on Tuesday, we will start simulating this uh, emergency meeting. And in that meeting, the major issue, the subject matter, will be uh, the positions of states vis-a-vis -vis the threat or vis-a-vis -vis the um, contingency of United States and or Israel uh, planning or you know, preparing, we don't know how the uh, Secretary General put this issue before you. Uh, she sent you an, a letter already, an email. email. I don't know whether, whether there were any backups and any follow-ups, any feedbacks, but um, it is important to, at least at this stage, um, have an understanding of what are the implications of Iran's nuclear program, how are these issues being perceived by the countries in the region. We, so far, uh, 
confine our attention to actually Iran's position. Iran is you know, being the country which is blamed for, which is accused of having a clandestine program. And actually, they are doing certain things that do not necessarily provide in, enough assurances for the international community. And it is not totally baseless. But at least you cannot just say it is totally unfounded for other countries to have suspicions, at least. Of course, we are not in a position to make any judgment whether Iran does have or doesn't have any such ambition. But uh, the point here is we have looked at the issue from Iran's perspective as to how they you know, present themselves or what are their claims. Then we also looked at the situation from the European Union perspective, from the United States perspective, from Russia's perspective. These are the key players as the title of the presentation that I use here as a template, the key players, the, the major players in the Iranian nuclear puzzle. So it, it's, it is a puzzle not only for the big players, but also for Turkey and something that I mentioned here on Friday last week. Because um, the reason why I put a little bit of emphasis on Turkey's position was on Tuesday I said there, there is no way but to have this P5 plus 1 plus 1 uh, formula, meaning P5, the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council plus Germany, and we have to add to this picture Turkey. And on Tuesday, when we spoke about the subject here in the morning and in the afternoon toward uh, the evening, we heard on the news that the uh, meetings between the, the negotiations between Iran and the P5 plus 1 would be conducted in Istanbul next January, about a month from today. So uh, that, in a sense, confirmed uh, our um, conviction that Turkey should be part of it. Part, well, for reasons that not only for, uh, for just you know, Turkey you know, having more uh, or higher profile in international uh, political arena over the last few years or several years, but also because it is something that definitely affects Turkey for the time being, and also is likely to affect even more in the future should Iran advance its capabilities even further. So Turkey doesn't want Iran to have uh, nuclear weapons. Well, there might be people in the public domain for some reasons who might not be uh, very much um, you know, concerned whether Iran has or doesn't have nuclear weapons, or some might even support Iran's nuclear weaponization. These are individual thoughts in the public domain because of the sympathy that exists among the Turkish population for understandable reasons. Not only because it is uh, stemming from the common history, but also it is because anti-American sentiments in the Turkish public domain. Because whatever is bad for the United States is good for sort of uh, the other. So. Uh, and so uh, <clears throat> this is therefore something that we looked at as to how the situation as it is today uh, affects Turkey, Russia, you know, EU, etc. So now that uh, you are going to represent all these countries like Egypt, for instance, Iraq, um, Saudi Arabia, and others, Israel. So. Um, I suggest you should take the floor right now based on your research and you know, what you have discussed with the diplomats, if you had any such connections already. If you haven't had any connections by, the, by this time, it's, it's, it's not that late, it's not too late, it's not still uh, you know, um, an impossible uh, situation, but I would strongly recommend to have access to these people at least to conduct you know, some interviews or just get their opinion. But based on your research, because this is not only uh, based on uh, discussions, interviews with the embassy people, but as I said many, many times, you have to conduct research um, through the internet, through library, through, I don't know, uh, resources that are available. All right, um, for instance, I can see the Israeli team, right? in front of me here, all four of them being present. And it was, we were about to talk about Israel on the uh, PowerPoint here, and this PowerPoint available for, uh, I don't know how many years on my website, and I 
suggested you a couple of times at least to have a look at the PowerPoint beyond the class hours that we touch upon this subject. So uh, then I will come to other groups and please uh, prepare yourself because it is very good to know at this stage to see whether you are really up to the task that you will be doing in two weeks time uh, and if there are any problems it is now time to see your weaknesses as well as your strengths if any all right so um, how do you think well you are not going to speak now as the representatives of Israel or Iraq or Saudi Arabia or Syria but being students who have undertaken this role I mean to play the Israeli or the Syrian or the Saudi Arabian or the Iraqi etc etc representatives having studied these uh, subjects from their perspective now in your own capacity as Turkish students I'm some of them are American students here um, how do you see the situation for instance Israel what actually in your opinion I mean so far that we have discussed the Iranian nuclear program more than two weeks already maybe we uh, put a lot of emphasis but this is a subject matter that almost the whole world is concerned so um, being the um, students who have carried out a certain degree of research so far um, how do you see how do you assess the situation now I mean the Israeli position I mean in my presentation there is this you know such and such Israeli position in my perspective based on what, what I have discussed with Israelis or what I read about Israeli position or of course filtered through my own understanding my own logic and what scenarios are more realistic than others? Yes, go ahead, Shuai. Uh, firstly, uh, Israel concerns, really concerns the Israeli uh, concerns to really concerns the region of security because of the treatment by the uh, Iranian nuclear ambitions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Israel tries to emphasize the, uh, not only regional but also the world uh, security. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, Israeli uh, diplomats and uh, pra uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, emphasize the uh, really, uh, strict uh, ambitions should be applied on the Iran. Uh, Carry on. Uh, not only the strict uh, strict sanctions, but also uh, their uh, speeches implies that maybe uh, there will be some concrete actions uh, towards the uh, Iranian, uh, even by the United States, mostly Israeli the government and diplomats. Uh, make uh, reference to the United States uh, mm -hmm. diplomats and their actions towards the Iranian mm -hmm. and uh, United States. You see the level of preparedness? Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Very, very well. Carry on. I mean, but, but by the way, uh, let me just pick up two points out of what you have said so far. Two important things. I mean, just to bear in mind, because you cannot always memorize things. I mean, it is essential to understand because you know, as I always say, for my for getting my driver's license, I memorized the whole booklet. I got 100 out of 100 from everything. Next day, I knew nothing. I, I forgot everything. So, but of course, how full I can drive. So, um, the point is that you have to understand things and you have to keep things in your mind in such a way that you can remember at least the logic, the framework even many years afterwards. So it, it, what, what, what is important from all of this, one point that Israel emphasizes is that it is uh, not only Israeli or Israel's problem with respect to uh, Iran's nuclear program. Or let's put it Let's put it that way, Iran's nuclear ambitions. It is not only Israel's problem, and this is something that is also uh, emphasized almost in every uh, speech that you know, is, uh, U.S. authorities extending from Obama to Clinton and lower it, uh, as you go down in the hierarchy. You hear something is Iran's nuclear program is something that will have far-reaching consequences for the region, 
it is not only a problem of Israel. So it is not only Israel who should tackle with this problem. And its neighbors, I mean, Iran's neighbors, must also have this concerted action, to put pressure on Iran, etc. This is, this is what we hear uh, from uh, Israelis and the Americans most of the times. What did that, uh, what it does this have any impact? I don't know, um, because, well, from the WikiLeaks, uh, as we now learn, uh, some regional governments actually express their opinion, their, their position that they are actually supporting Israel's concerns as well, that Iran is a problem for them, and that the United States and Israel and or Israel should do something. And this is something that also Israelis say. U.S. must do something, if I'm not. So uh, U.S. is the key to take any action, if at all it's going to be any. Fatih, you have a point here? I think that uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions are not only Israel's problem, but... This is the Israeli point of view, this is the U.S. point of view, and uh, because they want to in a sense, uh, expand the, uh, the front against Iran, so as not to be seen as something at the bilateral level between Israel and Iran. It, it is, therefore, this is not actually the situation, and for reasons that I just mentioned here, and also last Friday, Turkey, in my opinion, as I have put in my uh, published articles already, not something that I say right now, Turkey will be the most negatively affected country if and when Iran acquires its weapons. We cannot, of course, make this claim at this point because Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons and they always emphasize that they are not building one. And we, of course, have to take all these official statements into consideration. We're not in a position to make any claims without any uh, hard evidence or whatever. But we say if and when Iran gets nuclear weapons, Turkey will be the country whose position will be most negatively affected. There will be other countries who will be negatively affected as well, but because of the existing uh, parity, the balances between Turkey and Iran, uh, Turkey's pos position will be actually negatively affected the most out of all the other actors that are involved in the picture. Yes, and um, would you please complete your sentence? Yeah, I mean, of course, Israel, now we look at the issue from Israeli perspective. We have discussed Iranian perspective uh, um, for quite some time. And now I would like to hear from the country representatives, not as representing these countries, but just to see whether they are really ready for the simulation and also to uh, present their individual opinion I mean, as students here, as to how they assess the situation, having learned the positions of the countries that they will be representing. So one thing that Israel says, it is not only my problem. Yeah, Iran says, well, of course, Iran doesn't say I'm building nuclear weapons against Israeli nuclear weapons. Or they don't say my nuclear program is a response to Israeli nuclear capabilities. They don't say, they do not establish this connection. But they make these statements um, actually in different fora and imply at all times or make reference to Ira Israeli nuclear weapons. For instance, last time that was on um, 6th or 7th, yes, 7th of um, uh, December, just last Tuesday in the afternoon, as I just said, uh, it was declared that you know next round of uh, negotiations would take place in Istanbul and uh, Jalili was uh, interviewed by the international TV channel, CNN International, and whatever the, um, the, the person, the, uh, the reporter, asked him, regardless of what was asked, he made references to Isra uh, Israeli nuclear weapons and U.S. nuclear weapons. And he said, we should not talk about our nuclear program, but we should talk about uh, Israel's nuclear uh, weapons designers. They don't use the term Israel the Zionist state, uh, uh, the nuclear weapons of Zionist state or, and in United States. So this is, this is something that we understand. They never say we build nuclear weapons as a response to Israeli nuclear capabilities, but they reject to speak about nuclear ambitions. They, 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 they do not accept having plans to build nuclear weapons. 
But whenever this issue comes up, they make reference to Israeli nuclear capability. And on the other hand, what we learn from uh, the Israelis, uh, I mean the Israeli as a state here, uh, from uh, time to time they make this statement, look, this is, of course, uh, something that we wouldn't like to uh, be realized. Uh, Israel wouldn't like to see Iran with nuclear weapons. But it is not only my problem, they say. And also, they l turn their face to the United States, and they actually believe it is the United, it is the United States who should take the action if at all an action is going to be taken. Dan, back to you, Shwar, to any from the Israeli uh, sort of uh, team. Ege, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> wow, there's consensus within the group, even in the <laughs> explaining their individual views. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the Israeli government, especially the very abstract, with the uh, last United Nations Security Council resolution, uh, 1929, because of the sanction that applied on the Iranian government, and uh, the Israeli government really wants to extend the sanction on the uh, Iranian government. And on the other hand, the uh, Israeli government, uh, despite all, uh, despite the uh, uh, past aggressive speeches towards the Iranian government, but uh, still uh, stands on the more optimistic side and mostly optimistic in that respect. I mean. They believe Iranians will quit their ambitions, or no, uh, it is going to be, or there's going to be a much bigger international coalition that will be mobilized against Iran. Is it? Can be solved by peaceful means. Yeah, uh, Israel is uh, uh, hopeful in solving a problem with peaceful means. <laughs> Good for them. Yeah. Because Israeli government seems to more give response to the United States again. And waiting to take action by the United mm -hmm. States. So um, what you say is. From the Israeli perspective, the United Nations Security Council 1929, the, the, the very resolution that Turkey uh, voted no, actually cast its vote as negative. And that was uh, something that created a lot of anxiety in, in the international arena as to how Turkey, a member of the Western coalition, voted against uh, this resolution, which actually uh, made it uh, made the uh, sanctions tougher. Well, um, for those who may not have uh, had any chance to follow the details of this development, United Nations uh, Security Council Resolution 1929 was voted on June 9th, uh, less than a month after this swap deal, the nuclear fuel swap deal that Turkey, Iran, and Brazil have s signed in, in Tehran which was turned down by the United States and all the other members of the P5 and other, actually, except for the old three of them, nobody uh, seemed to give any support to the swap tail. Uh, for reasons that we discuss here in my article, et cetera, so I'm not going to go into that detail. But uh, the important thing about the United Nations Security Council resolution is that actually, yes, it, it is, uh, it's a little bit tougher in terms of substance of the resolution. Uh, and the, the previous resolutions uh, with respect to Iran and its nuclear program actually um, uh, incorporate a number of sanctions, restrictions uh, with respect to Iran's nuclear program. And these are not all out, these are not comprehensive sanctions. I mean, you cannot compare these sanctions with the uh, sanctions that were imposed back in the 1990s uh, on Iraq. So Iraq was under comprehensive sanctions. Almost every single item was proscribed, uh, was prevented from entering the Iraqi territory. And that's why we discuss here in this classroom, uh, many people thought these sanctions turned out to be weapons of mass destruction because they led to the killings of uh, large numbers, hundreds of thousands of uh, you know, babies, children, women, elderly, etc., because of lack of nutrition, medication, etc. So, but these are not that kind of sanctions. The UN sanctions uh, on Iran on Iran aim at preventing um, Iran to advance its capabilities in the nuclear field and also in the military field, and put restrictions on the trade of some technology, technical parts, or whatever material that may have any implications with. Weapons, program, weapons programs that Iran 
has and also a nuclear program and also put restrictions on some key individuals who may have any connections with Iran's clandestine efforts, etc., etc. So, therefore, the sanctions imposed on Iran are not sanctions that will prevent Iran from making trade with the rest of the world or, you know, uh, buying food or this and that. So, actually, that will run counter to the interest of uh, many nations because Russia, China, they depend on, uh, you know, uh, the trade. Uh, with, with Iran, European countries also depend on the trade and also, you know, buying some oil, gas at different levels. I don't know about the, you know, content, the, the exact figures, but many nations would not like to have comprehensive sanctions imposed on Iran. But what is important here is, and, and they, they sort of uh, looked at the issue from. Uh, the political perspective, from diplomatic perspective, the resolution 1929 was indeed valuable in the sense that it reconfirmed or reaffirmed the stance of the, of the international community that Iran's situation was being uh, screened, was being uh, sort of uh, uh, followed very closely, and that there is this determination in the international arena not to let Iran become a nuclear weapons power. So. The significance was this. Why did Turkey uh, cast a negative vote? Well, this is something that has to be uh, understood within its own context. Because there was this swap deal on May 17, less than a month ago. There was this deal between not only Turkey, Brazil, Iran, I mean, among them, but also between this group and the so-called Vienna group, composed of uh, the United States, Russia, IAEA, etc who would sub give uh, Iran the 20% uh, enriched uranium that would be necessary for the uh, research reactor in Tehran. And the Turkish representative to the United Nations, uh, Ambassador er Ertuğrul Pakan, made a statement when he cast uh, Turkey's vote as negative. He said, we are sort of uh, use casting our vote as negative because uh, the Vienna Group's decision not to implement the deal, and their declaration that just came today on the very day of this voting is, you know, uh, quite interesting. And therefore, uh, this, has, this has had an impact on our decision, meaning that the uh, uh, Turkey's vote might have been different. And also, in the same sort of speech that he delivered at the United Nations Security Council, he said, we are still sort of a uh, keeping some of our concerns about Iran's nuclear program, we, we suggest our Iranian friends, colleagues, to, be, to provide more transparency and to be more cooperative with, uh, in, in their relations with the International Atomic Energy Agency, etc. So this resolution, 1929, is something that might make Israel happier because of the reason that I just made here, because it reaffirmed or underlined again emphasize the international community's determination not to let Iran become a nuclear power, I mean, military power. And, and because, and this is very, something that is very much in conformity with what Israelis say. It's not a, only our problem, it is a problem of the whole world, because if there is this nuclear non-proliferation regime, the nuclear non-proliferation regime is composed of not only the MPT, which prevents the non-nuclear weapon states who have agreed to become a non-nuclear weapon state and signed and ratified the treaty and therefore promised to never ever develop nuclear weapons. Uh, and the MPT aims at uh, you know, keeping them non-nuclear. There are also certain other arrangements such as the nuclear exports uh, regime, of, you know, some um, limitations on exports of some sensitive material to some countries of concern whose behaviors uh, are not necessarily uh, providing enough assurances that they are not going to use this technology that they will acquire through transfers for only and only peaceful purposes. So therefore, um, uh, the, uh, the Israeli position is that, yes, they are outside of the MPT. They have never signed or ratified at all the treaty, and they have never uh, expressed any interest in the treaty in, in terms of becoming a member, but uh, they all, always emphasize, look, you are 
you know, um, assigning a certain degree of importance to the MPT in their uh, you know, discussions with other groups. And the MPT regime will remain in force so long as no nuclear power uh, comes into the center stage of politics. Yes, there is this example of North Korea. And North Korea, after staying for long years outside of the MPT, uh, they became a member of the MPT in the late 1980s under the pressure of uh, the Soviet Union. Then, throughout the 1990s, they always cheated their position. Finally, when they found um, as some sort of an opening, especially during the, uh, prior to the uh, second Gulf War in 2002, war was in March 2003, and prior to that, they expelled the IA inspectors who were there based on some six-party talks and, you know, quarter apartheid agreement, all sorts of arrangements. And then they advanced and accelerated their program, and they tested twice in October 2006 and um, also May 2008, I guess, uh, at two times, and they actually revealed their nuclear capability. So... Uh, Therefore, the nuclear non-proliferation regime came under heavy pressure as to whether this regime, the MPT itself being at the very center of the regime, whether it is a powerful element, whether it is something that is worth you know, sticking to. I mean, you know, uh, because uh, especially this year in May, the, in May 2010, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty was reviewed again after five years because every five years, uh, in, in five intervals, the MPT was reviewed on this year as well. So uh, this is something that has to do with upholding the very basic principles of the nuclear non-proliferation regime, which doesn't allow Iran to advance its capabilities for military purposes. So there is no way Iran can use its capabilities for military purposes. So therefore, if Israel is going to be negatively affected, of course this is for sure, and we, we understand this from the statements made by the Iranian uh, clerics, the, 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 one, the mullahs in the administration, and also others, including uh, President Ahmadinejad, foreign ministers and other people at different levels, that Israel is actually uh, one particular sort of uh, actor which the Iranians put on target in terms of their statements, their very harsh, hostile statements. But of course, um, it is important to bear in mind whether this is actually uh, also um, uh, substantiated. Whether Israel does anything to uh, Iran or threatens Iran with, um, threatened Iran in the past with anything that would you know, uh, uh, prompt it, the Iranian side to develop any weapons. Because, I mean, by looking at the situation between, for instance, India and Pakistan, you can see there is this hostility, you know, stemming uh, from the uh, years when they, when India won its independence from British, uh, Great Britain, and then, you know, this has led to the breakup of Pakistan. Or, so therefore, there is this deep-rooted hostility and I I Indian nuclear program prompted it the Pakistani nuclear program, and they said, I mean, we will do whatever necessary to develop nuclear weapons because otherwise we cannot, you know, keep our sovereignty, we cannot survive. And the Indian nuclear program also owes much to the history between India and China. And India and China, they had their, you know, uh, territorial problems, wars, and a certain proportion of the territory claimed by India to be Indian now is under... Chinese occupation from the Indian perspective. So we, we are not going to go into this detail, and we don't know who's right or who's wrong. But there we, you can understand uh, why India developed nuclear weapons after a 64 detonation of China, I mean, in 1964. Then this is something that prompted Indian nuclear program. And Indian nuclear program prompted the Pakistan nuclear program. So there is this chain reaction. But in the case of Iran's nuclear program, it is hard to say uh, that Israeli nuclear program prompted Iranian nuclear program because there is not much in common in terms of, you know, posing direct challenges. Yes, of course, from Iran's perspective, what, Iran, what Israel is doing in the Middle East with respect to the Palestine issue, 
the, 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 its position in Lebanon, its hostility against Syria, which is a close ally of Iran, etc. These might be, you know, explanations. But whether the, the, they will be satisfactory, that's a whole different question. So, uh, what we have to bear in mind, just in closing the first hour, Israel says it is a much wider problem than being only my problem. So everybody must be equally concerned with Iran's nuclear capability. Second, if there is any actor who can do anything, not only because of its military capabilities, but also its political weight, et cetera, et cetera, it is the United States. So in a sense, they, um, uh, they, they sort of hide themselves behind the United States, or at least they push the United States uh, to the fore. And the UN Security Council resolution is, in a sense, confirming that you know, there is this international concern, something that makes the Israelis happy. So in the next hour, we will look at the position of uh, other countries like Syria, like uh, Egypt and uh, Iraq, maybe. Then I would suggest you to use this break uh, for at least making some, having some consultations among the members of the team. All right, I'll see you in 10 minutes.